Well, good morning. Welcome to church. Come on, we're going to stand. Let's worship those joining us online. Come on, you join us as well.
privilege to be in his presence this morning. You believe he's a risen saviour? Come on, church, you believe he's risen? You believe he sits on the throne? He's a good God, full of love, full of mercy, full of grace. And so we're just gonna take a few moments now just to begin to pour out your heart to him. Will you do that? Just to begin to thank him that even in the valley you may be in, he draws near. Maybe it's just a letting go this morning. Maybe it's from past failures. And Jesus says you are forgiven. And for you to lay that afresh at the feet of Jesus and take that sonship, knowing that in Jesus dying on the cross and the power of His resurrection, you are set free this morning. When you're feeling unworthy, He says you are worthy because of the blood of Jesus. Come on, will you spend some time, begin to give Him praise, pour out your heart. If it's brokenness you're facing this morning, you pour that out to Him as well. Thank you, almighty creator God, that you would come in pursuit of your people, that while we're still sinners, you died on a cross for us. So holy, full of all glory, and to think that we have a personal relationship with you because of your love for us. So this morning, God, it's only right that we join all of heaven's angel armies to declare that you sit on the throne, that at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth will bow before you. And we cry out and say, you are holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Your name is the greatest, your 
Lord, hear your people sing this morning. We come, we gather to worship you, to glorify your holy name. Because, Lord, you are the one we were created for. You are the one this world needs. You are the one who meets the deepest needs of our heart. And so, Lord, we pray, would you be lifted high, exalted, glorified in our presence, in our midst here this morning, Lord, we pray, in our community, in our city, in our world. This is our prayer. And we proclaim that you are holy. You are perfect in every way, God. Oh, Lord, we worship you now in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to take an opportunity just to welcome you to our service this morning. So good to have you. We're going to take a moment to welcome each other. Before we do that, kids, you are in with us today, but we have some activity packs for you at the back. So kids, if you head up to the back, the old buzz leaders are there with an activity pack for you. And why don't we turn to those around us, welcome each other. And a big welcome to those joining us online this morning as well. So good to have you sharing with us. Helen is your host this morning. So let us know where you're watching from. And welcome each other online as well. So good to have you here. job welcoming one another this morning make sure you continue that after service as well i did want to particularly welcome you if you're new here today it's so good to have you here with us um, we have a connections lounge after service so if you're a new person head there and we'd love to meet you i want you to feel really welcome here with us this morning um, if if you're here with us um, you're just new attending here with us as well so if you're new online reach out to your host helen there online so we can connect with you as well but we want to make sure you feel welcome and a part of everything that's going on um, we normally, um, in the school terms, have our kids program, uh, but we have uh, got the kids in with us today. So we always say here, don't worry if kids make a bit of noise in the service. We don't worry about that at all. We love the sounds of life the kids bring to our congregation. We know how important children are in the kingdom of God, so we love having them as part of our worship. Um, and there is an unsupervised crash for little ones, but it's not supervised this morning. The parents will need to stay in there. Uh, but just to let you know about that as well. We're so glad the kids can be in with us for the service today. There is a family service on next Sunday morning. So if you're in that family stage of life, our Buzz team run a service where the parents stay in. It's a 45-minute um, kid-friendly service where you can join with us together as a family and worship together as well. So make sure you keep an eye out for that next week. We had an amazing weekend last weekend for our Easter services. We're still in the um, afterglow of just the blessing that was poured out there. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone who prayed, who invited friends to come along um, to see so many here. So many stories of um, family members and friends and colleagues coming along, attending services, and as well as God answering prayers and moving in hearts as well. A highlight was definitely the baptism service on Easter Sunday night. We had 21 baptisms across the whole um, Easter weekend or Easter Sunday, which was amazing. Yeah, praise God. It was incredible to celebrate and all those baptisms. If you're there on the Sunday night, it was amazing to see everyone getting baptized. And it was a real mix of ages. Uh, and a real highlight was at the very end of the service as we were just um, uh, worshiping together, um, Jim Yonkers, who's 79 years old, came down spontaneously. Is Jim here in the service today? Jim's here. Jim, stand up. Can someone tap Jim? Stand up, Jim. Stand up. This is Jim, got baptized last Sunday night. Fantastic. That was amazing. Praise God, Jim. Came down in the middle of the worship and said, you know what? I need to get baptized as well. I haven't done this yet. I need to do it. And what a highlight for him to be baptized. I quickly jumped in, in the pool. I didn't have a chance to get changed. I went home wet, but I didn't mind. It was fantastic. Um, and then to see all the young people coming forward and just congratulating Jim was just an amazing way to finish the weekend. So thank you to everyone who was involved with that, all the hosts, our creative team, our tech team. Um, did you know that um, during those Easter services, they had seven different computers crash, as well as some network issues, never had issues like that before. They realized pretty quickly, hang on, there's something more going on here. There's a spiritual battle going on. And so they were praying into it, persevered. Praise God, you didn't notice, did you? It all came off. But we should thank Ashton and Caleb and our amazing tech team. Just did a phenomenal job over those services as well. 
They do so much in the background you don't see, but I want to tell you their heart is to see people connect with Jesus and uh, our online ministry is such a blessing through all the work that they do in the background as well. So very thankful for that. Also, big thanks to those who gave towards our Easter appeal. Uh, $20,000 so far has been raised, which is an amazing response. That appeal will stay open for a little bit longer, supporting the work of Bridge Care our care arm, helping people in need across our community, do an amazing job under Pastor Jody's leadership and the whole team there that are involved as well. But a great cause to support. Make sure if you're giving to that, if you want a tax receipt to give to Bridge Care Limited, not through the normal Bridge, Bridgman channels, but give to Bridge Care Limited if you want a tax receipt and they can organise that for you as well. Also want to mention our Alpha courses starting. We've got about eight different Alpha courses starting after school holidays, some are in coffee shops, some are here on site on different days of the week as well. If you've got questions about faith, questions about life, wanting to know what all this is about um, in, in greater detail, come along to the Alpha course, six-week course. It's free, chance to ask questions in a safe environment. You watch a video together, share some food together, and then have a chance just to discuss with other people exploring faith. Amazing course. Millions of people have done it. Really want to encourage you to be a part of that, including an online alpha. If you're watching online, we'd love you to link in and being a part of that as well. So we're looking forward to that kicking off. And then today, our 4 p.m. service is on. I think in the newsletter, it didn't mention it, but it is definitely on 4 p.m. Scott McLeod, our church um, planning pastoral intern, is going to be sharing with us there as well. So you're welcome to come out and encourage him. And then tonight, 5.30, Pastor Travis will be sharing there as well for our 5.30 p.m. service. I did want to mention too, Pastor Ty and Shah had a little baby boy last weekend. Uh, Hezekiah is um, their name. So congratulations to them. They're on leave for a little bit. Uh, but Ty will be back with us soon. We look forward to welcoming little Hezekiah in person as well. I just want to check too if Chris and Rachel Woodrow are here in the service today. Not with us, they might be away. I can't see them yet. They might be away for Easter, but just on the passing of Chris's sister, we're praying for them as well. Or maybe they're watching online this morning. Just be thinking of them and praying for them. I'm going to pray over some needs uh, for our church family now. Let's join our hearts together in prayer as we do that. Heavenly Father, we want to say thank you for the tremendous, amazing blessing poured out last weekend. So much to give you thanks for, so many stories of you at work. Thank you most of all just for your presence with us, Lord, as we worshipped and celebrate. As you're here with us again, Lord, thank you for the truth that every Sunday, every day, every day is Easter Sunday, Lord, because you're alive and you're risen and you're with us, Lord. And so we thank you for this truth. Thank you, Lord, for um, just the way you continue to move in our community, in our city, for more. We're praying for more, Lord, is our prayer. We're praying for lots many more times, Lord, when there's 21 baptisms on a Sunday is our prayer. And Lord, we want to lift up Chris and Rachel to you this morning on the passing of Chris's sister. You'll be near to them as a family. Comfort them, we pray. Uh, Lord, we want to lift up Bev to you this morning, Lord. Be near to our sister, your healing power. For Denise as well, Lord, we pray. For Gloria. For our brother Mayor, Lord, be near to him. Your healing touch there, we pray. For Nairi as well. Oh, Lord, we ask you be so near, surrounding Murray and Nairi with your love and your comfort and your presence, we pray. For Aileen at the moment, for Owen undergoing treatment, Lorraine as well, Lord, for your powerful healing touch, for Karen and for Vicky as well, Lord. We bring these ones to you. And Lord, we thank you um, for the gift of your word that you long to speak to us. God, you're not distant, but you're so near. And so we open our hearts to you as we hear from your word now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, we are so blessed to have Pastor Jody coming to bring the word to us, launching our new series, The Miracles of Jesus in the Gospel of John. Will you make Jody feel welcome as she comes to share with us? Thanks, Nathan. Thank you, church. I am going to launch straight into God's word this morning. So come with me to John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, reading from the New International Version this morning. On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, they have no more wine. Woman. Why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. 
Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you want to reveal to us today by your spirit now. I pray that you'd ready our hearts, God, to be open to you speaking. Lord, take these human words, God, and breathe your spirit life into them, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Church, I have a confession to make to you this morning. On the last outpouring night, I was actually attending a pink conference. There was a terrible gasp from Pastor Peter in the front row right there. It was terribly bad planning on my part. I'd been given this ticket. And then when I found out that it was the same night as our day of prayer and outpouring praise and worship and prayer night, which I love coming to, I was devastated. It was an awkward moment for me when I had to confess to Nathan that I wouldn't be coming to outpouring And why? And there have been several awkward moments since then as you have come up to me and gone, how good was outpouring? And I'm like, oh, I was at pink. Now, I can't say for sure whether Jesus would have gone to the pink conference over an outpouring night, but I love the way the Gospels portray Jesus as this person who loves to party. Do you know that? Do you love that? Here he is at a celebration, a wedding party. And when they need more wine, because they ran out, Jesus comes to the party so they can keep on celebrating. Jesus comes to earth as fully God and fully man. And in this story, we see Jesus' godiness does not keep him separate from humanity, he embraces it. There is little doubt when we read the gospels that Jesus enjoys hanging out with people. Jesus seems right at home in the midst of a wedding feast and enjoys the extended celebrations of eating and drinking and dancing as was the cultural practice of a first century Jewish wedding. If your picture of Jesus at this wedding is one where he is somberly sitting off in the corner, praying over all those revelers at the party, looking down his nose in judgment at their raucous behavior, that is not the Jesus we read about in our Bible. If this is your picture of Jesus, I'm not sure where that came from. The Pharisees and the experts in the law held Jesus out to be a drunk and a glutton because he was so comfortable hanging out with tax collectors and sinners. Jesus was not afraid to step into everyday humanity, even into the awkward and messy parts. I often think about that when I'm at streetlight. Sometimes situations and conversations can be a bit awkward and uncomfortable for me. But I think about how right at home Jesus would be there, listening and loving and laughing, comfortable in the interactions with all kinds of people. 
He wasn't scared that other people's sin would contaminate or rub off on him. He was completely secure in his identity, which meant he could live out his purpose of showing God's heart of love, even at parties and even around sinners. The Gospel of John is quite different to the three other Gospels in presenting Jesus to us. The other Gospel writers seem to take more of an earth-up approach to reveal who Jesus is. But John comes from this heavenly perspective. John does not want us to miss from the outset here that Jesus is God. He opens his gospel with a statement about Jesus being the eternal word of God, with God from the beginning, God stepping into earth to reveal his glory to us and all who believe him and accept him. He gives the right to be children of God. John actually states his purpose for writing this book way over in chapter 20, verse 30 to 31. He says, there is so much more that the disciples saw Jesus say and do, but he's written the things that he has so that we may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. What a great reason to dig into this book and examine these miraculous signs revealing who Jesus is over these coming weeks. John focuses on using the backdrop of Jewish culture and ritual to highlight Jesus' identity as God and to magnify his purpose as the Messiah they had been waiting for. John's gospel starts with the ministry of John the Baptist. They're actually two different people, by the way, the writer John and John the Baptist. But John tells us about John the Baptist who came baptizing with water to prepare the way for the Lord. And he is waiting expectantly for the one who will come and baptize with the Holy Spirit. Many of their symbols, cultural symbols and religious practices were pointing to this one, this Messiah who would come. But when he came, they had trouble recognizing him. John does not want that to happen to us. The people around Jesus had this rich history with God. Moses was their savior, the one who gave them God's law. David was their king who established them as a nation. But in their unfolding history, they had turned away from God. They'd become overcome by oppression, oppression from nations around them, oppression by their own religion. It had become so burdensome to them. The prophets of old had promised a Messiah, a saviour king who would come from God and rescue his people and once again establish his kingdom. A sign of this kingdom to come had been prophesied by Isaiah as an elaborate banquet, much like a wedding feast. Listen to what Isaiah says in chapter 25, verse 6. In Jerusalem, the Lord of heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meat. And so, with, this, with all this background in mind, John's first sign of the Messiah's arrival just happens to occur at a wedding feast. Weddings were then and are now joyful celebrations, aren't they? We get a picture of weddings um, from first century life in Mark's gospel, where the bride is ready and waiting with great anticipation for the moment of the groom's arrival. He is all prepared and comes to collect his bride and lead a procession back to the wedding feast, the wedding banquet. 
These days, weddings are often all wrapped up by 10 p.m. But in those days, the groom, if the groom had done his job well, the joy of feasting on food and wine and dancing could go on for days, even a week. I have no doubt that at these wedding celebrations, there were moments for remembering that those prophecies, that a prophecy from Isaiah, anticipating and maybe even comparing the present wedding feast to the one the Messiah would one day host for them. Just as an aside, I had a moment of remembering and anticipating at the Pink concert. I mean, Pink was good and entertaining, and the crowd adored her. But I couldn't help but sit there in Suncorp Stadium and wonder, long for a day when 50,000 people might gather in our city and worship the King Jesus. Amen? Can you imagine? Well, in the midst of their dreaming about the future feast of the Messiah at this wedding, Little do these people realize, but the Messiah is Jesus, and he's already in their midst. They just didn't know it yet. They are celebrating at this banquet, and their Messiah is right there celebrating with them. I wonder how many weddings Jesus went to throughout his life where this happened. But this time, his secret identity would not go unnoticed. There was a Messiah revelation about to unfold as a drama unfolds at this wedding. Weddings are not meant to be events where dramatic things happen, are they? In fact, a couple will go to great lengths to make sure that every moment and part of their wedding goes precisely to plan. I've seen it. There is a wedding practice to step through every step of that wedding. There are hair and makeup trials to make sure you get the look just right. There is even weeks of dancing lessons to make sure that the three minute bridal waltz is just perfect. Did you know that? It's a lot of pressure. But sometimes even with all the right planning, unexpected things can happen, can't they? I um, took a wedding last year and the couple informed me that they had lined up an owl, the bird kind of owl, to bring the wedding rings down the aisle. They described how this was going to unfold to me. They said the groom, at that point when we come to the ring vows in the ceremony, the groom would put on a leather glove and turn towards the door of the chapel and the owl would fly down the aisle, land on the glove with the wedding rings. I'm glad to say that we actually had rings to share in those wedding vows that day. Because I didn't want to be the one to ask, what would happen if the owl got distracted and flew away with those rings? The drama that unfolded here in Cana was a catering misjudgment. The wedding feast was in full swing and they ran out of wine. Now, you have probably been to weddings without one and had a great time. But in this culture, where weddings were the pinnacle of feasting and celebration, this was not a good thing. It would mean not just embarrassment at this oversight, but dishonor and shame to the host. It could even bring into question the quality about the union, the quality of this marriage taking place. It was a bad sign. No one wanted to live their married life being known for the wedding that ran out of wine. Mary knows about it and she comes straight to Jesus. Jesus, we have no more wine. If this was Jesus' first miracle, why did Mary go to Jesus with this problem? I've been wondering about this. 
You know, maybe Mary is appealing to her son's compassionate heart to help people, you know, so that he could do something here. Maybe she was thinking that him and his disciples could kind of run to a neighboring village and grab as much wine as they could to allow the party to continue. Or maybe Mary had already witnessed something of Jesus' miraculous power in the privacy of their home life. Maybe as she watched him grow in wisdom and favor with God, there were nights around the dinner table when the loaves of bread multiplied unexpectedly to feed the hungry boys. Or maybe the dinner that had been sitting on the fire far too long didn't actually taste burnt. Maybe Mary already knew from what she had witnessed firsthand that Jesus was the Messiah. Maybe she was waiting in anticipation of the day when his identity would be revealed. She had witnessed firsthand the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. She had witnessed the remarkable wonders that went with his birth. All these things she pondered in her heart. Maybe Mary was waiting for the Messiah to unfold. Jesus' response sounds a bit abrupt in our English translation, didn't it? Woman, what am I supposed to do about this? But he's not being rude here. He is, however, being courteously direct in making it clear that he is not on Mary's timetable here. He's on God's timetable. But still, Mary seems to be tuned in to something that God is doing in in these events unfolding. She says nothing more to Jesus, but she turns to the servants and she says, do whatever Jesus tells you. I think that is a sermon in itself, don't you? Do whatever Jesus tells you. Notice Mary doesn't tell Jesus. The problem, she simply states the fact, Jesus, they've run out of wine. She acknowledges the situation She brings it to Jesus, and she trusts that he can and will do something about it. Jesus seems almost reluctant to step in here. He wants to be sure that this really is God's time. Revealing his identity publicly will start him on a road that leads to his death. Jesus' reference to his hour, his hour has not yet come, is the the term that John continues to use as Jesus refers to that work on the cross. Is Jesus' hesitation due to the weight of the cost that he is going to bear as his true identity comes to light? He needs to be sure that this is God's timing for God's plan to unfold. Jesus' affirmation comes at the sight of six stone water jars used by the Jews for ceremonial washing. I think it would be easy for us to skim over that detail in the story. But these stone jars in that moment represent what Jesus actually came to do. To set people free from the law that kept them bound to ritual religious acts. Hand washing and ceremonial cleansing was part of this instituted religion. A system of rules that took priority and overshadowed the relationship that God longed to have with his people. The constant requirement for cleansing was a reminder that everything in life was defiled and separated them from God. A God who only seemed to ever be condemning them. Running out of wine was symbolic of where these people were at spiritually. There was a lack of joy, a lack of meaningful connection with their God. Looking at those stone jars was a picture for Jesus of the inadequacy of a religious system of cleansing that could never fulfill their need to be clean before God. Jesus had come to do that, to fulfill that requirement, to make us clean 
John says in chapter 1, verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. The law had become this overbearing burden and Jesus had come to fulfill the law, to usher in a new way. The old covenant of the law is fulfilled in Jesus and a new covenant of grace has come. The prophet Jeremiah foretold it like this. He says, a day is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with my people, the people of Israel and Judah. This covenant will not be like the one I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt. They broke that covenant, though I loved them as a husband loves his wife, says the Lord. But this is the new covenant I will make with the people of Israel after those days. I will put my instructions deep within them and I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Jesus is about to inaugurate this new way. In the context of cultural practice that was attempting to do all the right things on the outside to make people clean. Jesus is doing his work on their inside. These jars used for ceremonial washing are turned into the vessels used for this picture of the outpouring of God's spirit. The Messiah has come. The new way is here. Let the banquet feast begin. Jesus told the servants to fill the jars with water. The servant's action of obedience is notable here. Following Mary's instruction to do whatever Jesus tells you to do, they didn't question Jesus. They didn't even half fill the jars. Did you notice the detail? The jars were filled to the brim. That is around 150 gallons of water. Not the one liter Ikea jar of water that sits in your fridge. This was a huge amount of water. I calculated it was around 680 litres of water these servants filled in these jars. That is no small gesture of obedience when you think about buckets being carried from a well. That is obedience requiring commitment and effort. That's a lot of water and a very generous amount of wine. Jesus simply instructs the servant to draw from the jar and take it to the master of the banquet. There is no hocus pocus or magic words or formula here. We know the jars were full to the brim, so nothing else was added. This is no trick taking place. The servant fills the cup out of the water jars and walks over to the master of the banquet. I feel the tension for this servant as he hands the glass to the master of ceremonies who sips the wine. Was he holding his breath, waiting for the response? Would this moment bring joy to the party or dishonor and disgrace? The MC tastes the wine and calls over the host. I think the servant would have still been holding his breath, trying to read what's going what's to happen next here. A miracle has certainly taken place. The master of the ceremony of the banquet is amazed at the superior quality of the wine that he has just tasted. The best wine has been saved till now. No one ever does that. This miracle is pointing to a new reality. The new way of the Messiah, the best way, is here. The prophet Amos prophesies about a day of restoration and this beautiful abundance that we see here in this miracle. He says, the Lord says, a time will come when the grain and grapes will grow faster than they can be harvested. Then the terraced vineyards on the hills of Israel will drip with sweet wine. A picture of the Messiah has come. 
linking to the abundance of wine at this feast. A sign of God's kingdom, the joy of salvation, the day of restoration is here. You can almost see the smile on Jesus' face, can't you? As the host kind of nods in bewilderment that he's served the best wine now. Water turned into wine. Amazing. This would be a great story, even if it was just about Jesus saving a wedding celebration and performing a miracle of providing wine at his friend's wedding. And it is that. But it's more too. John intends for us not to miss the significance of the symbolism of this first miracle happening at a wedding feast where ordinary water is turned into amazing wine. The days of ordinary water are gone. Jesus is here. He's doing something fresh, something new. Jesus will soon share wine with his disciples that represents his blood being poured out in this new covenant. Because of Jesus, we get to live in this new covenant, in this new way of the Spirit being poured out in us, bringing freedom and joy and life and power in Jesus' name. It's for everyone who believes. Everyone who believes will be called children of God and they will live in the likeness of their Father who does this. Verse 11 says that Jesus, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. John John prefers to refer to these supernatural displays of Jesus, as we'll see over coming weeks. He refers to them as signs rather than miracles because their purpose is not just to show that Jesus has this amazing power to do amazing things. Their purpose is to bring revelation of Jesus' true identity, to reveal the glory of God in him. And as we come into this series on miracles, we can be sure that Jesus can and does step outside the natural order of the world and reveal his supernatural power. He is still doing that today. And when he does it, it is in God's timing and in God's way and for the purpose of revealing God's glory. There's no magic formula for it. We can't conjure it up or make it happen. We simply come to Jesus in an act of faith, obedient to what he tells us to do. We place our faith in the one who is revealing his glory and we get glimpses of faith every time he does. The temptation for many people then and and also for people now around these miracles is, is to chase after the signs and wonders, to be focused on the things that we want God to do for us. But God is actually calling us to something much deeper than that. Belief in him, relationship with Jesus. That means putting our trust and faith in who he is, not just about his power, by faith in his character, his faithfulness and his love. I've loved soaking in this story this week. And as we close, I just, I just want to mention a couple of things that I think we can take away from this story. The first is that Jesus is fully engaged in everyday human life and activity. He is literally interested in the commonplace events of your life. Don't get so caught up in John's spiritual symbolism and miss the simple truth that Jesus stepped into the wedding of friends and fixed a problem for them. Jesus is the one who makes a way in our problems too. He brings joy and gladness to situations that are headed for dishonor and shame. Jesus cares about the difficult situation you are in this morning. He wants you to bring it to him. 
He wants to reveal his heart of compassion and grace to you today. The second thing is this other level that John writes at and points to about who is in our midst. Jesus, our Savior, is here. He's right here this morning, church. For those who have been living under the oppression and burden of religion, feeling like you have to work and strive to please God, feeling like you will never be good enough for Him, that is water. That's the old way. Our Savior has rescued us from that. He's made a new way for us. He overcame death so that we could have life. Come to Jesus. Experience freedom and joy that he has made possible for you. Believe in him and experience his spirit poured out in you. This new wine that he has made for us. Don't go back to that old way of water. Jesus met all the requirements of the law for us. Our salvation has been won by him. And where his spirit is, there is freedom. The third thing that I want you to notice in this passage, and some translations lose this point because they don't quite know um, how it fits in the, the timing and chronology of John. But translations who kind of look back to the Greek, the literal Greek, actually start this passage with the, the, with the words, on the third day. And it positions us, doesn't it, with expectation for what is about to unfold. We know the significance of the third day. We just celebrated it at Easter. Jesus' resurrection happened on the third day. And we live in this post-resurrection life of Jesus, post the victory Messiah has won for us. And I can't help but wonder if John's reference to this unfolding on the third day is because we are meant to live like it is always the third day. With the anticipation and expectation that God is always about to do something amazing because that's who he is. Jesus is alive. He has defeated death and conquered the grave. We are no longer slaves to sin. Amen. We have been forgiven and cleansed and set free. And now we live with the resurrection life and power of Jesus. We are meant to get excited about that church, expectant about what the Spirit wants to do in our midst. How much joy was there celebrating last Sunday night, 20 baptisms? I had a moment at the end of service, we kind of lined everyone up and then there was just this joyful melee of people trying to congratulate, get to people, there were tears, it was so beautiful. I had this moment in the midst of it, just marveling at the incredible work of Jesus being poured out on that night. The lives that are witness to his life-giving work. And don't we long for more? Let's live in third day expectation that God is not done yet. There is more yet to unfold. And finally, I think there is a beautiful message in this story that Jesus takes out ordinary and turns it into something extraordinary. Often I feel like all I have to give is water. Don't you feel like our, our words are just water, our actions are just water? Our time, our efforts, even our gifts can feel like water. But in Jesus' hands, he takes our water and turns it into something beautiful and valuable, extraordinary in his kingdom. He is the one by his spirit who breathes life into ordinary old water. 
and make something amazing. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Believe in your heart this morning that Jesus can take your ordinary and turn it into something extraordinary for His glory. As we close and the band comes, I just sense there was a word today for some here are feeling dry, lacking in that joy that we talk about, not feeling that freedom. Allow Jesus to come. Allow his spirit to be poured in you in a fresh way today. Know that he sees you and that he cares. Know that there is a new way to do life in him. Let's pray together, church. Lord, we thank you for your word, your beautiful word. Lord, I thank you that you are the God of wonders, the one who takes our ordinary and and by your spirit does extraordinary things. Lord, we lay our ordinary before you this morning and we ask that you would touch it again, that you would pour out your spirit here, that you would continue to reveal your glory, God that we would be a people who believe in you, testify to your greatness and your glory. Continue to fill us with faith, God, to be obedient to you, to see you do more in our midst. And Lord, I pray for those who who are dry this morning, thirsty for you. Lord, I pray they would be filled by your spirit today. Touch our hearts, God, we ask. In your mighty name, we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing a song of joy to finish this message this morning. This is a a song of joyfulness in our great God who turns graves into gardens, our mourning into dancing. If you need to dance this morning, you have my permission to do that. Just be careful you don't knock someone else out in the process, but be filled with joy and faith and life and hope as we worship our mighty God. Search the world, but it couldn't feel me. Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are oh, not enough. When you came along and put me back together. I'm not afraid to 
Last Sunday night, someone who was here in the service sensed God saying to them, look around the crowd and see if you can find one person that does not have joy on their face, is what they sense God saying. So the person looked around the crowd and sure enough could not find one person there in the congregation who did not have joy, wasn't filled with joy, the joy of the Lord in their lives. This is God's desire for each one of us. That wedding feast that we would know joy that is found only in Him. God wants us to know that. He wants us to know the joy of the Lord as He comes and works among us. Let me pray, Lord, we thank You for the joy that comes in knowing that you're alive, that every day is the third day. Every day is Resurrection Sunday in you, Lord, because you poured out your spirit, your resurrection power made available to us. And I pray, Lord, that the joy of the Lord would be our strength. I pray that for some here this morning. You'd fill us, Lord. Moments as we gather together and worship like this, we'd know your joy flowing, overflowing out of us, Lord. A joy that's not dependent on our circumstances and situations, but a joy that comes from knowing you, you, Lord Jesus, the risen King, the risen Saviour. And so, Lord, bless each one, I pray, as we head out this week. Lord, thank you that you're with us and you're for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we lift our hands for our Saviour one more time this morning? Amazing. You can be seated. If you'd like prayer, some of our prayer team will be down the front and our prayer lounge at the back. Remember, if you're new, we'd love to meet you at our Connections Lounge in the foyer as well to say hi to you and introduce you to some others and those joining us online. So good to have you with us. God bless you. We look forward to connecting with you again soon.